Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the book of Leviticus, the book of holiness. I'm John Walker, and along with others, I'm sitting with Bruce Watsek, the minister of the Princeton Church of Christ. Bruce, where are we in our study of Leviticus? Well, we just got started. Uh, we introduced the book, kind of looked at the overview of it, how it was put together, and what the overall message is, which, uh, as we put in the title, it's about holiness, the holiness of God, and then how God wants to also make us holy uh, as he is holy. And so it's interesting that, of course, from the Old Testament perspective, if you're going to approach a holy God, uh, it's only fitting that you start out with a sacrifice. And so the opening chapters of Leviticus are the sacrifices uh, that should be offered and can be offered, and all the variety of different types of sacrifices. Uh, last week, uh, we saw in chapter one uh, that he introduced the burnt offering. This is the one that I told you in the Greek, the word for completely burnt sacrifice was the word holocaust. And that's where we get that word. Uh, and this was a sacrifice that was completely consumed on the altar, and only the smoke went up to God. And uh, that was always a beginning sacrifice that every day in the tabernacle and later in the temple, they would start the morning with a burnt sacrifice, and they would follow it with a grain sacrifice every day. And they do the same thing in the evening. Um, and so he starts off with these two fundamental uh, sacrifices. And of course, the burnt offering, uh, the only purpose that's alluded to there is that it serves in some way for atonement. Uh, so if we're going to approach a holy God every day, we start off by completely sacrificing uh, the offering to God. It's totally God's. We're giving it all away. And then secondly, on top of that, we bring a grain offering. Uh, and in this one, they only took a small portion of memorial and burned it. The rest was given to the priests and the Levites because, of course, they were going to spend all their time working in the temple. And so they had to depend upon those who came to make sacrifices uh, for their food, on, if you will, their daily bread. And so this was unleavened bread that was prepared for the grain offering uh, for the priest. So those are the two sacrifices we looked at, and we looked at some of the dimensions of giving and sacrifice. And so uh, tonight we're going to look at uh, the next one in order, chapter three. And we're gonna look at chapter three, but we're also going to look in chapter seven. In chapter seven, it's, it's six and seven, it deals with how the priest is to deal with these various sacrifices. And there's a lot more commentary on the sacrifice we're going to talk about uh, today in chapter seven. So we'll be going back and forth between uh, Leviticus three and Leviticus seven, looking at um, what is translated in most translations, uh, the peace offering. So let's begin uh, chapter three of verse one. If your offering is a fellowship offering and you offer an animal from the herd, whether male or female, you are to present before the Lord an animal without defect. You are to lay your hand on the head of your offering and slaughter it at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall splash the blood against the sides of the altar. From the fellowship offering, you are to bring food offering to the Lord, the internal organs and all the fat that is connected to them, both kidneys, with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which you will remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons are to burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering that is lying on the burning wood. It is a food offering, uh, an aroma pleasing to God. Bruce, what is, uh, what is the peace offering? Uh, some translations uh, like King James and the uh the English Standard Version uh, translates it peace offering. Uh, the NIV, I think, sometimes translates it the fellowship offering. Um, the reason for that is we really don't know 
exactly what the root of this uh, particular word is. It's kind of its own unique word. It kind of vaguely has some of the uh, letters that are in uh, our word for shalom, but it definitely doesn't come from that. But because it had some vague similarity, <clears throat> some of the rabbis would refer to this type of offering as a peace offering. But when they think of that, they're not thinking about you're trying to necessarily establish peace with God. So so many times we think about sacrifices, we're, we're approaching sacrifice from the vantage point of the sacrifice of Jesus, the once for all sacrifice for our sin that allows us to have access to God. But the sacrifices in the Old Testament are not all about uh, a sin sacrifice. They're not all about uh, having access in that way, having our sins forgiven. And the peace offering or fellowship offering is one of those offerings that really has uh, nothing to do with uh, forgiveness. It's instead a kind of celebration uh, in the praise of God in the presence of God. Uh, it's a voluntary offering. It's not required. I think maybe at Pentecost, it might have been a, a um, offering of this type required in conjunction with others. But basically, this is a voluntary thing that a family chose to do. And the major difference between this and the two sacrifices we've seen before, in the burnt offering, it's all consumed on the altar. And then with the grain offering, it's given mostly a little bit on the altar, and the rest is given to the priest. But in the peace or fellowship offering, uh, you bring an animal, its inner organs are, are given uh, and fat are sacrificed. Uh, some of the meat is given to the priest, we'll look at that later. But mostly the person making the sacrifice then gets to eat a meal with this animal they have brought. Sometimes they would be eating it in the temple in later years at, at the time of the tabernacle, they would just go to the center of where their camp was and, and bring it back uh, to their own tent. But uh, this is, uh, I think we have to kind of get in mind the, the difference in their world and ours. Uh, they didn't eat meat every day. They didn't, they couldn't eat meat every day. Maybe the, even the wealthiest person might perhaps have access to meat every day. The average person would be fortunate to eat meat uh, three or four or five times a year. And so uh, this was a special occasion. This was almost like our going out to eat, going out to dinner. They would bring it to the Lord, sacrifice, but then they got to share in a common meal. And this was a meal usually big enough, it was much bigger than the uh, family, uh, you would have your extended family, maybe your clan, uh, maybe your small village even uh, could share, depending on what animal uh, you were sacrificing, if it was large enough. And so this was a celebrative meal, uh, a fellowship meal that you celebrated in the presence of God. Uh, and this was a real positive, voluntary uh, experience of joy in the presence of God. Let's notice what it says in uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 12, uh, verses 5 through 7. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present your vow offering, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. So the whole idea of the peace offering or fellowship offering is you are celebrating in the presence of God. You were sharing a common meal with uh, your extended family or clan. Uh, it was a joyous occasion. Uh, and so you actively rejoiced in the presence of the Lord. You know, we think later on, we know for sure uh, that some of the Psalms uh, were sung 
uh, during these occasions. They celebrated how great their God was and how he was blessing them. The fact that they had peace in the land, that they could then come and had enough extra to be able to make a, a sacrificial offering and eat a, a large meal with your extended family was a great occasion. Uh, and this is interesting. Um, the same kind of idea goes over uh, into the New Testament. The, the early church uh, met not in temples primarily, but in, of course, their own homes, and they met around a, a common meal. So even to begin with, a very nascent church that began on the day of Pentecost and was situated in Jerusalem, uh, it had a, a component of a common meal together. And uh, we're told this in uh, chapter 2 of Acts, uh, verse 46 and 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, of course, again, the church at this time was uh, completely Jewish in its makeup. Uh, they were in the city of Jerusalem. The temple was still functioning. And so they would go, as would be the custom of most uh, Jerusalem inhabitants, they'd probably go for the morning sacrifice and then again for the evening sacrifice, which was a time to offer prayers in the presence of God. But also, they no doubt were bringing some uh, fellowship or peace offerings because it says they went home and were breaking bread in their homes and received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, and of course having favor with all the people. So again, their gathering together were times of praise and, and rejoicing. And there's nothing better than getting together with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and and celebrating a meal together, spending time together. Um, that's what the early church did. That's what caused them to have such a close bond. And in the context of the Old Testament, the peace offering was an opportunity for you to share a wonderful common meal uh, of really good food that you didn't normally eat uh, together with your extended family. So that's what we find uh, the peace offering uh, telling us. Now, to get a better feel about that there were a variety of peace or fellowship offerings, uh, let's uh, look at uh, chapter 7 of Leviticus, uh, verse 11 through 15. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings that one may offer to the Lord. If he offers it for thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves of leavened bread. And from it, he shall offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood of the peace offerings. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of, of his offering. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. Now, yeah, so here we have more detail that the peace offering is also the same thing as a thanksgiving offering. Uh, in other words, you're thankful for God's blessings. You're thankful that you have the abundance to share with your extended clan or family to go in the presence of God and to share uh, this wonderful meal uh, together. And notice the difference in this sacrifice is you can offer either male or female uh, animal. Uh, also, it says here that uh, you add to that leaven bread along with unleavened bread. So remember on the original grain offering had to be unleavened bread. But when it comes to the peace offering, you bring both leaven and unleavened bread. And you leave one of the loaves of leavened bread 
uh, for the priest who officiates, who takes the blood once the animal has been killed and the blood has been drained out and throws it up against the altar. Um, and so a Thanksgiving offering, uh, uh, offering of praise and thanks to God, um, again, you know, our lives should be full of that because we are doubly blessed with things in Christ. We have greater access to God, greater knowledge of God, uh, and we are certainly blessed spiritually, but also in other ways as well. God uh, takes good care of us as his children. And so there was always an appropriate time to offer a Thanksgiving offering. And then there are two other potential peace offerings. Let's uh, continue on in verse 16 through 18. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow offering or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice. And on the next day, what remains of it shall be eaten. But what remains of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned up with fire. If any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten on the third day, he who offers it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be credited to him. It is tainted, and he who eats of it shall bear his iniquity. So, Bruce, what is a vow and free will offering? So, it was very common in the ancient world for people to pledge to do something and make a vow to God that they will do this thing, give a certain thing, accomplish a certain task. And once you'd accomplish that task, you were relieved that you had fulfilled your vow. And so you would go and celebrate uh, with your other uh, extended family members because they would rejoice with you that you had made a vow to God that you had fulfilled it and now could celebrate that. So uh, that was the occasion for the vow uh, offering. And then the free will offering, just as it suggests, it's, uh, it's just that I'm just... Uh, I'm happy to be a part of the extended family of God of Israel, and I want to freely make a I want to give the rest of my village a great opportunity to gather at the temple, now at the tabernacle, and to celebrate a meal together. And so in the presence of God and one another, uh, we'll have a great celebration. And so that's a free will offering. Uh, and so all of these were forms of peace offering. They were all voluntary. You're not under an obligation to do this, but it's what you did uh, to celebrate your life and your blessings and to share it with others. Notice he said, the first one, you know, don't let it last to the next day. So if you're going to eat it all up, that means you've got to bring a bigger group. The notice it said for the vow and free will, you can leave some meat over to the next day, but after that, you're, you're not to do it. What this does, of course, meat could become tainted over time and would not be good for you. But also, this encourages the person not just to make a sacrifice and keep it all for themselves, their close little family that they're eating leftovers for the next uh, uh, next week or so, but you, you want to invite a much larger group to participate. So all of this was encouraging you to share what you had with a larger group. You're, broader extended family, clan, uh, your villagers, depending on the animal that you had uh, to sacrifice. And so uh, here, it makes very clear that there are a variety of reasons why you might choose to do this and to have this wonderful common meal together uh, in the presence of God. But there were some, always some conditions on that. Uh, by the way, this is instructions in chapter six and seven to the priest, their kind of side of the responsibility for each of these sacrifices. And so let's pick up with uh, the next verses, verses 19 through 21. Flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned up with fire. All who are clean may eat flesh, but the person who eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offerings while an uncleanness is on him, 
that person shall be cut off from his people. And if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether human uncleanness or an unclean beast or any unclean detestable creature, and then eats some flesh from the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offerings, that person shall be cut off from his people. Bruce, uh, what does this uncleanness refer to? Well, we're not gonna go too in depth to it uh, today because there's a whole section in Leviticus on clean and unclean. Uh, but it's not, as we might tend to think, about moral purity, although there are some things that are moral that uh, can pollute you or not. But there are a variety of ways that ritually, uh, and we'll talk more in depth when we get to it, in certain things, touching a dead body, uh, this, these things polluted you. You had to go through a process of cleansing. Uh, again, I think all of this uh, is to remind you that when you approach God, you can't be casual about it. You can't be haphazard about it. You've got to make sure you're in the right state. You're in a state of holiness that if there's any uncleanness, you purified yourself so that you can present yourself to the Lord. And whatever sacrifice you're bringing, it also must be clean as well. Uh, you can't offer something unclean uh, to the Lord or share that in a common meal, in the presence of God. And so, uh, again, I think it's just a reminder uh, that we have to be prepared when we come uh, to meet God and worship God and for them when they offer their sacrifice of peace uh, in the tabernacle. Let's go back to chapter three and we'll finish up the chapter. We'll skip one because it's almost identical uh, to the next. We'll pick up on, uh, the, we won't go through the lamb offering, but we'll pick up with the goat offering, verses 12 through 17 of Leviticus 3, and uh, we'll take a look at uh, that. It's almost identical to the lamb offering, and then we'll draw some conclusions. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and lay his hand on its head and kill it in front of the tent of meeting, and the sons of Aaron shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then he shall offer from it as his offering for a food offering to the Lord, the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver <clears throat> that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all with your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. So Bruce, why, why were they allowed to offer lambs, goats, as well as cattle? Um, well, think through it. Uh, earlier, we noticed uh, God on the burnt offering allowed them to offer either cattle, a bull, male bull, or they were all male sacrifices, a lamb or goat, uh, or uh, pigeons. And the idea was uh, everybody could bring a sacrifice. Even if you were destitute poor, you could bring a little, uh, a little bird. They were like, cost you a penny and make a sacrifice. Uh, so obviously it's a much more expensive item to bring uh, cattle than it is to bring a sheep or a goat. Uh, and so it made it, if you will, accessible for people of various economic uh, conditions. Now, it doesn't allow and the peace offering for you to bring a bird because this is going to be a meal. And the, the birds that they would talk about sacrificing, there's not enough meat there to have a one-person meal, uh, much less a shared family meal. So it doesn't include that in the peace offering, but it does make a meal more accessible to people that don't have the resources to purchase or bring one of their own cattle. Maybe they don't even have cattle. Maybe they only raise sheep uh, and goats. Uh, but everybody could be a participant in this. And of course, you would invite the poor that perhaps didn't have things to share in these meals. 
when you would gather with your family so that everybody uh, could rejoice in the presence uh, of God. So it's interesting, though, uh, that, uh, again, they, they burn on most of these internal organs. And what's significant about that is most other uh, religious people of that time, when they would kill an animal, they would bring out the liver and the kidney, and they would literally try to read the, these things as signs and omens of what the future held or what was going to happen. I mean, there's elaborate kind of instructions on this that the Egyptians wrote and other Mesopotamians wrote. We have uh, all kinds of writings about how they interpret it. And so, so that his people would not be tempted to do that, you're to take all those organs, you don't have to look at them, they're not going to tell you anything, and you're to give them to a priest and he's to burn them completely on the altar. There's not going to be any divination. And uh, you take the fat as well, and all the blood, and all of that is offered uh, to the Lord. That's kind of interesting, the idea of uh, no blood and, and no fat. But let's look at uh, back in uh, chapter 7, verse 22, and following for a little more instruction on that. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. The fat of an animal that dies of itself and the fat of one that is torn by beasts may be put to any other use, but on no account shall you eat it. For every person who eats of the fat of an animal of which a food offering may be made to the Lord shall be cut off from his people. Moreover, you shall, you shall eat no blood, whatever, whether or of fowl or of animal in any of your dwelling places. Whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from his people. Why were they, why uh, are blood and fat rather um, forbidden? Well, it's interesting. I think we, we know fairly explicitly why blood was uh, forbidden. Uh, even all the way back to Noah, uh, they were forbidden uh, to eat or drink blood in an animal. They could drain them out of the animal. Um, but uh, the idea of why they can't eat the fatty portions um, is not as explicitly uh, presented, but we'll take a look at what I think is a, a good hint at how they looked at that. Um, but the reason why they were not to uh, eat the blood is found later in Leviticus uh, chapter 17, uh, where in verses 10 to 11, he explicitly explains uh, why they were not to eat the blood. If anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I give, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And so, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, the crucial distinction. You're not to drink the blood or eat the blood because the blood is the life of that animal. And this life is being sacrificed so that you don't have to die. This is back to the idea of substitutionary atonement. This animal died so that you would. This animal died so that you could share a common meal, but you're not to take of the blood, which is very common. Lots of ancient people drank blood and and perhaps made blood uh, sausages and other things like that were very common. But they were not to do that because it was a reminder the life is in the blood. And the blood is the essence of the pouring out of the life of whether it be an individual that says his blood cries out from the ground. 
back when one brother killed another. So one's life blood uh, has great power. And this was a reminder that atonement was made with this blood and had to be given to the Lord so that you could live in peace and so that you could approach God uh, with a confidence and so that God would bless you uh, and your extended family. But now back to the fat. Uh, let's go back to uh, one of the familiar stories and, and take a look at it a little different lens all the way back in the book of Genesis uh, chapter four, uh, the event with Cain and Abel. There's one element of that that I think might hint at uh, the significance of the fatty portion. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. I just wanna note, you know, a, a lot of ink and, and talk has been spent over why, why the sacrifice was not acceptable. Some people, of course, say because uh, one was not offering an animal sacrifice, that's why it wasn't acceptable. I don't really think that's necessarily the case. I think the difference in the two was it says uh, in the course of time, Cain brought the Lord an offering of, and in the, in the Hebrew, it's very explicit, some fruit. It's like kind of like a cat, you brought some fruit. Okay, I grow some fruit of the ground, I bring some of that. And Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock, the best, and of their fat portion. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Why? He was bringing his best, and his brother was just bringing something. Well, I guess we got to make a sacrifice for the Lord. All right, let's see. Here's something, I'll take this, some kind of leftover. Again, in contrast to the firstborn, didn't say the first uh, uh, grains from the crop and the, the very best, just some of the fruit of his, which is probably grain, might have been some other uh, things as well. But I think that's the distinction. And Abel gave the better offering because you know, not only the firstborn, it was the fatty portion. So this was considered the best because when you when you cooked it, the fat, of course, in it melted and and would feed into making uh, the food taste uh, even better. And so the idea is that's the better portion, and uh, so therefore that should be given to the Lord. Even when you share your own common meal, you should burn the fatty portions as well as uh, get rid of the blood so that you don't partake of either one of these. So I think it's just a, a reminder of giving your best to the Lord. Um, you know, we can even see dietarily, it may not have been that beneficial for them to consume vast quantities of fat, not necessarily very healthy uh, and good for you. But they probably were not thinking so much dietarily as we would, but they were thinking instead of, uh, giving the best to God, God reserved the best, God got to choose the best, you gave that to him, and then you got to take the rest as he prescribed, because he was the one that blessed you with the animals, he allowed them to live, he's allowed you to live, he's allowed the crops to come in, it's God who's blessed you, and so this is a celebration of that blessing, uh, and so some belongs to the Lord and is consumed uh, on the altar, the fat as well as uh, the blood. Then let's look at the last uh, section uh, that discusses the peace offering. 
uh, chapter 7, uh, verse uh, 28 to 36. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hands shall bring the Lord's food offerings. He shall bring the fat offering with the breast, that the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. The priest shall burn the fat of the altar on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. And the right thigh you shall give to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Whoever among the sons of Aaron offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, I have taken from the people of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron, the priest, and to his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel. This is the portion of Aaron and of his sons from the Lord's food offerings from the day they were presented to serve as priests of the Lord. The Lord commanded this to be given them by the people of Israel from the, from the day that he anointed them. It is a perpetual due throughout their generations. So Bruce, what was the wave offering for uh, in this account? Yeah, I always get a little kick out of that. I used to read wave offering. I thought that's like, <laughs> hasta la vista, we'll see you later. Uh, but of course the wave offering was just that you presented uh, the sacrifice to the Lord and then you gave this one to the priest. Um, and so the idea here is it's going to be a celebratory meal. You brought an extended family. There's plenty of food for everyone, but the priests that are working and, and are doing all the, the things that take care of the tabernacle and the sacrificial system, they too get to share in this. They get uh, a breast and then a uh, thigh, right? Thigh, so that they and their family can celebrate along with you and your family as they are in the presence of God, uh, thankful for all of his many blessings. This is how he said, this is a perpetual thing. This is not just a one-time thing. This is an ongoing thing. This is how the priesthood is to be uh, supported. So uh, with that, we have I think the essence of the peace or fellowship offering. I think the closest thing uh, to this uh, in the New Testament is what we call the Lord's Supper, uh, where at least in the context of the first century, this was usually celebrated over a common meal uh, that they shared together. And so to get a feel for that, let's look at a passage that should be uh, familiar to us, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 11. Let's look through some of what's said there. Picking up at verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Well, first of all, to just get a feel, uh, of course, Corinth was, uh, if you will, uh, the problem child among all the congregations that uh, Paul established. Uh, it was a fairly affluent city. A lot of people traveled through it. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, immorality and godliness. And uh, obviously, some of the new Christians were also quite selfish. So he says, it's not really the Lord's Supper you're eating. Why? Because when you get together, um, some of you brought food, and you go ahead and eat. Somebody else that gets there late and this is probably the servants and slaves who couldn't get away as quickly and didn't really have anything to bring, and they go hungry, 
because you've eaten all the food, those of you that had resources. You didn't bring it, share it. And matter of fact, you indulged in it, even on drinks. Some of you drank so much wine, you became drunk uh, at the gathering of the saints over the common meal. You've abused this and humiliated those who have nothing. Shall I commend you? Absolutely not. So it was a, a uh, some of them were showing a total disregard for their fellow brothers and sisters. Like, what do we say about the peace offering? You brought the food and shared it with others. Those that had shared with those that had been invited. Uh, but what was happening, these uh, Christians at Corinth that had were bringing and eating all the stuff themselves. And then when others came that didn't have anything, there was nothing for them to eat. And they humiliated them uh, by the way they treated them. So this was an ungodly behavior. Now let's continue on his instruction. For I have received from the Lord that uh, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on, this, on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, so under the new covenant, when we eat together, and we, of course, reduced it to the simplest elements, the unleavened bread, because the Passover is when Jesus celebrated, and they had a period of unleavened bread leading up to that. So they clearly would have unleavened bread at the Passover meal. And so we have unleavened bread and then fruit of the vine because it was unfermented grape juice, just like unfermented uh, bread uh, was what was drunk at that particular occasion. And so we share those key elements when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But of course, the early Christians were celebrating this over a meal together, just as Jesus had a common meal, uh, a Passover type meal with his disciples when he inaugurated this. But of course, just think how different this is. They were forbidden to drink blood. And now, although it's just, it is grape juice, uh, it's symbolic of the blood of Jesus. And remember what in the Gospel of John, how a bunch of people just said, boy, this is a hard saying. You say, we've got to eat your body and drink your blood to have any life in us. Whoa, sounds like cannibalism and telling us to do what the law forbids us to do. We can't, <clears throat> we can't follow you anymore. So some of the things Jesus said that God was calling people to do went against some of their understanding about what the will of God was. Uh, but of course, God was now making a once for all sacrifice. So you wouldn't have to have daily, constant, continual sacrifices, but once for all sacrifice of Christ. And so we remember that sacrifice, meaning on the day of the resurrection, so it's a celebration. It's not, it's not just, it's not a funeral service. It's a celebration because we're doing it not on Friday when he died, but on the first day of the week when he was raised. So we remember his sacrifice, but we remember it from the vantage point of Resurrection Sunday, not from sad sacrifice uh, Friday or dead in the tomb Saturday. Instead, we celebrate on the first day of the week, which is the day of the resurrection. And then he gives some moral exhortation uh, to them in light of this, what this meal means, this blood of the Lord and body of the Lord. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. 
So just like in the sacrifice, you can't just offer any animal. You can't approach God in an unclean state. So he's exhorting them. If you're going to partake in the body and the blood of the Lord, you've got to be treating your brothers and sisters right. You can't be at odds with them. So you're going to sell a communal meal. You need to show proper uh, concern for everyone. Uh, and I think in context, when he's talking about, you know, we have to discern the Lord's body, uh, it could, of course, mean the body of Christ on the cross. But I think in context, he's talking about the body of Christ. That's what they're not discerning. They're not discerning. These are my brothers and sisters, and I'm not treating them with respect and consideration. They were eating and disregarding those that were hungry. They were drinking, didn't care whether anybody else had anything to drink or not. And so that was not a true supper of the Lord. They'd forgotten that Christ called us to self-discipline and unselfish living, not to continue on in the selfish way that we may have lived before. And if we don't, we'll bring judgment on ourselves. Remember how the sacrifices, he said, and this person will be cut off from his people. He won't be allowed uh, to be a part of the covenant community if he disregards my instruction. And here he says, you know, this may have killed literally, spiritually, and maybe physically too, some of your own myths because you have not learned the lesson of agape love shown for one another as Christ sacrificed himself for everyone, not just for you. We are here for Christ and for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And our meal remembers Jesus, and it remembers in the present we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and we partake in his body, and we are part of his body. And so are you, all my other brothers and sisters. And so I am concerned about how you are doing, not just how I am doing. And I think an interesting place to kind of wrap up a our thoughts about this fellowship or peace offering is to look at a passage uh, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, uh, verse 15 through 16. We'll wrap up our thoughts by taking a look at this. And, and this is kind of at the end of the whole book of Hebrews talking about how Christ has replaced the animal sacrifice that once for all sacrifice now made it where we have access to God uh, through him. And then he concludes some of his exhortation at the end of the book. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So notice, he starts off by saying, we have an opportunity to continually, on an ongoing basis, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That's, of course, the Thanksgiving uh, sacrifice, which is a fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So we sing and we acknowledge who is Lord of Lord and King of King, who we serve, and who is the one true God. We acknowledge him. But not only do we do that verbally, but he said, do not neglect to do good. And what also to share what you have for such sacrifice of pleasing to God. So we do the right thing. But we also share what we have. Again, that was what the uh, peace uh, sacrifice was all about. Sharing a common meal, sharing what you had with your larger extended clan and family. And that's, I think, the kind of sacrifice that God wants us uh, to participate in, looking for opportunities to share what we have with our brothers and sisters, making sure we do good, and that our lips also are filled with the praises of God, both in prayer and in singing. Uh, and so that's how in Christ, uh, the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice of, of praise and remembrance. Uh, and our singing, of course, is as well, our prayers and uh, hopefully we are also motivated to do the good that God gives us the opportunity to do and share what we have 
uh, with others. And uh, that, uh, by God's grace, we seek to do. And that's our sacrifice, since Christ has offered the complete and absolute once for all sacrifice that gives us access to God. Our sacrifices now are not of an animal nature, but are of a communal nature as we share our common life in Christ and show true agape love uh, for one another uh, as we live out the lifestyle of Jesus. I hope that this gives you some insight into the peace or fellowship offering. Uh, and next week, we'll go into what's called the sin and the guilt offering, uh, which we'll save for next time. Uh, but be reading ahead, a lot of interesting things uh, to learn as we move ahead on what God is teaching uh, his people about how they can remain and live in a holy relationship with God, where they can be holy and they can be in communion with a holy God. And that, of course, is what we seek to do. But now we have, of course, the once for all sacrifice of Christ that gives us our ready access to God. And so we praise God for what we have in Christ. I praise God for all my brothers and sisters. And I praise God that we share of our resources so that others uh, can be helped as well. And so John, offer up a, a prayer of praise as we close out this time. Father, we come to you uh, elated father that you have been so good to us we thank you for the gift of your son and eternal life and hope hope in this life and the life to come for the comfort guidance and discernment of your holy spirit and father we thank you for each and every soul present especially those of the household of faith that we get a chance to demonstrate that father you are a present god a god of hope a god that uh, that builds up and through his people. Father, we pray that we are, uh, we, we uphold the banner of your son, Jesus, that we uh, continue to prove and, and show uh, love that has come down from you. And we thank you for Bruce and his ability to explain and teach clearly your word that we might be equipped to explain uh, to others, the reason for our, our hope in you. And Lord, as we uh, carry on, and for those who are listening live and on the recorded version, we pray your continued blessings and guidance upon us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Good night. <laughs>